On today's Monday Night Travel, we explore Ukrainian culture and its fortitude. Traveling via train from Poland to the capital city of Kyiv, special guest Ian Grant joins us to share more on Ukraine's captivating cultural front. From the country's vital train system to beautiful street art, the rise of Ukrainian music, and so much more. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel. My name is Ben Green, and I have the great pleasure of hosting tonight's program on a remarkable country and culture, Ukraine. Our guest tonight is Ian Grant. He is the creator and producer of a PBS travel series called Culture Quest, and he also produced a one-hour special on Ukrainian culture that was filmed in September 2022. Ian also previously won an Emmy for a series that aired on the Travel Channel. So please join me in welcoming Ian Grant. Good evening, Ian. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, man. I appreciate it, man. It's great to be here. We're so thankful you're taking some time out of your evening. And uh, Ian, where are you tuning in from? Uh, Minneapolis, uh, where it's, uh, I guess, eight o'clock with an unusually balmy uh, early December here, so. Fantastic. Well, it's typical weather here near Seattle. It's just rain, so no, nothing surprising <laughs> Straight about it. Straight up that. rain, no, no options in that forecast, right? No, unfortunately not. I think this is the wettest time of the year. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Yeah. But Ian, how did you come to create Culture Quest and produce a one hour show on Ukraine? Well, uh, creating Culture Quest was uh, after I had the, the travel channel thing, which was based on my business. I used to travel around the world finding interesting cultural objects that I would bring back to the United States. Uh, and my my feeling about those objects was they would come back with the story of the culture they're from, uh, the history of the present and the future of, of those people and places that I was visiting. And I would sell them to shops and designers and around the country, as well as a shop that I had here in, in Minneapolis. And then Travel Channel found out about that. And we did a, a very brief uh, series on, on Travel Channel uh, that, that very much in quotations followed me around the world uh, doing what I do. And that was in 2009. But ever since then, I wanted to do a, a more in-depth version, a less, tra you know, I love, I like Travel Channel. Uh, although now it sounds like they mainly focus on ghosts and stuff. So maybe that's not my cup of tea. But at the time, they did some really cool actual travel stuff. So I liked it. But, you know, it, it's not as in-depth as I, I wanted to go. So I chased after this a uh, model that that eventually became Culture Quest, and uh, eventually, after working on it for four or five years, got a greenlit by PBS, and then found our uh, founding funder, uh, college in Southern Minnesota, Gustavus Adolphus Col mm -hmm. College, uh, and they got us up and running to make the first season happen. So that's that's how Culture Quest happen. And, and the tagline for Culture Quest is looking at, you know, looking at life through the lens of artists and artisans and mm -hmm. uh, keepers of culture all, all around the world. So that's that's kind of what we do. Um, yeah. Fantastic. And how did this one hour special on Ukraine fit into the, the series of Culture Quest? Well, that's that's a yeah, that's a, a bigger, obviously a bigger, a bigger story. You know, I was like everyone around the world well, uh, was watching what was going on there in horror, you know, and and uh, was seeing coming out of Ukraine on, on social media, musicians and artists and authors and, and all sorts of people getting their voices out in the world, making sure the rest of the world knew what was going on there and that it was a country worth fighting for. And I remember very clearly there was one one clip that I saw, and it was a musician playing uh, an upright piano outdoors with a big crowd of people around. And and honestly, I thought he was, you know, I thought it was one of those uh, you can play the piano and then go on your merry way sort of things. And he was playing this heart wrenching, uh, what I assume was a classic uh, Ukrainian song, uh, both of which was wrong. He wasn't just uh, you know a random person. He was uh, Slava Vakarchuk. The lead singer for Okeon Elsie, which I quickly found out halfway through 
listening to it. So he's like, for people that don't know him, he's often referred to as like the Bruce Springsteen of, of Europe. I mean, he's, he's huge, really huge. And there he was just belting out this song on this, on this upright piano, just pouring his heart out. And, you know, music, especially to me, and I'm sure to most people is such a visceral thing. Like I was sitting there like, oh my God, this is just unbelievable. And then I started seeing art coming out. And there was one guy in particular who was sheltering in this bomb shelter, young guy, uh, no family. Uh, and the only reason I mentioned that because he was sheltering with the family. And that, that husband and wife had, I think, a, a, a little girl and they were in this bomb shelter and all he had was a paper and pen and was sketching the family and they couldn't come out. They had run out of water and they run out of power and all this sort of stuff. And he just kept on sketching and somehow eventually they got out and and the the, the sketches got into the uh, international media. And I was like, oh, man, this is to me, this this is such an important role that art can play in life it, it can it can give such an immediate reaction as long as you're able to get it out there so it's at that point that i thought oh my god this is it's exactly what i feel this series is about about how art can be such a transformative thing and culture to me can be a, a transformative thing as well a lot of times people think of culture as being something that happened in the past but to me culture is an evolving thing. And, and I, I like that idea. And that's what I was seeing going on in, in Ukraine as well. These traditional songs that suddenly became these rallying cries uh, of, uh, what was that that song, the Blue Verbena or something like that. Mm. There was this, this uh, and I'm totally blanking on his name and I should have written it down, but he, he sang uh, this song in one of the squares in Kiev and it just became... It, it blew up all over the place. Even Pink Floyd uh, covered it with him uh, playing it. And it was that seeing all this stuff coming out, I thought, all right, I got to go. So so first thing I had to do was, I, I mean, talk to my wife, uh, who, full disclosure, has nothing to do with the show. She has a an un unbelievably great medical device consulting business. But, you know, she's my... Uh, <laughs> my my whatever Jiminy Cricket or something like that she'll say no don't do that uh or yeah do this and she said yeah if you can do it safely uh relatively safely I mean it's a war zone but you know you can take precautions if you can do it uh as safely as you can make it do it because it's exactly what what uh it really is what this series is about in in many ways so after that, I then, of course, had to talk to my cinematographer, who's, whose name is also Ian, as as you know. So there are two Ians, but I had to see if he was willing to go as well. Uh, and I knew he would be. He's he's up for you know, he he likes digging into these things. And we've traveled. I mean, he was my shooter uh, on the Travel Channel show, and uh, obviously was my shooter for for the first season, and will be the shooter going forward. I mean, he's ridiculously great we get we got nominated for an emmy for our first season for cinematography so he just he makes it look like we've got four other uh shooters on these on these uh episodes and it's just it's just him so once ian the other ian has said yeah let's let's go then i had to get it funded because as you know not everyone watching knows this but PBS, uh, at least at my level, is not like I'm. I don't work for CNN or BBC. I'm not Anderson Cooper or, or someone like that who gets handed a travel packet and you know you're going to meet this person. Here's how you're going to get there. Here's the paperwork. Here's the hotels and all that stuff. That doesn't happen. So it, from there it was me trying to first of all find money to go mm -hmm. to go do it. Uh, and I went back to Gustavus and they. Very much to their credit, I mean this absolutely genuinely, they're, they're, they don't ask me to say this. They stepped up and said, yeah, this is a valuable thing. And I we, we think you should go do it. And and what, what a lot of people also don't know about the relationship with Gustavus is there's a classroom portion to it. So I go and meet with the classes. I did it for the first season. Uh, and for this episode, for the Ukraine episode, we, we talked about what I was going to see and do. And then went and filmed the episode and went back and talked about what, what happened in Ukraine. So there's 
that element to what was going on with Gustavus. So Gustavus saw real value in this and and helped fund the fund this episode. And then came the uh, trying to figure out how to get there. And just just to give you and, and the, the viewers an idea, you know, in the first season, we went to Mong uh, Western Mongolia, way the hell out in Western Mongolia. It's hard to find somewhere further, you know, uh, off the beaten path, right? It took longer to get to Kiev, mm -hmm. a major European capital city, than it did to uh, get to my yurt in Western Mongolia. So flying from Minneapolis to Amsterdam, from Amsterdam to, to Warsaw, then I had to uh, ahead of time book two cabs in case one didn't show up to take a three hour trip uh, to Helm on the border. I had to hope that the train that we were gonna take would pick us up, uh, get there on time and hope that we didn't have any paperwork to get across the border. So we had to kind of hope that these two Yahoo's, uh, you know, the two Ian's would would get across without getting shut down really quickly. Uh, so it, it was a lot of it was a wing and a prayer. And I tell you what, I mean, we we talked to uh, the Ukrainian media center beforehand. I did uh, asking, you know, how do we get there? And, and they absolutely wanted to help. They totally wanted to help. But they said, we don't know. We we don't know we don't know what the border situation is going to be like when you're coming here. We don't know if you go by train, by cab, by van, by bus. So there there it was a very fluid uh, environment, and I, I'll I'll never forget. Um, you have to go through two border crossings: the the Polish one and Ukrainian one, and that's actually out of this 14 hour overnight train trip from Helm to yeah, from Helm to uh, uh, Kiev. Uh, four hours of that is spent at the border. Mm -hmm. So the border guards would come through the train with this stack of passports from everyone else on the on the train, and then they'd arrive at our uh, a two bunk, uh, two bed berth, and look at us and ask for passports, and they'd see the American passports, and they'd say, "Well, do you have any documentation, or why are you going into Ukraine right now?" Uh, and we'd look at them like, "We don't really have anything." Uh, we're filming a show, and the the Polish border guards, you know, got kind of bored and and just said, oh, "Forget it." They took our passports and moved on. The Ukrainian ones were a little more involved, and and it was a little touch and go. Uh, but I, I ended up showing them a, a bunch of different, you know, I mean, anything. I I showed them our website, our Facebook, you know, whatever. I realized anyone can make a Facebook page and a website, but I was looking for anything that would give us legitimacy. And then I started telling, you know, we're going to be meeting with this person and that person. And I think, I think I just finally maybe just wore them down <laughs> and they said, <laughs> just go, you know, where I, you know, so, so that's, that's how we wound up getting there. Uh, well, it's, that's just incredible, Ian, you know, I mean, we're so thankful that you went through the trouble and that you produced this amazing content for us. Uh, well, and 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 I want to say ju just for the record, uh, it it is an absolutely no comparison to what I I chose to go there, you know. And I think of the Ukrainians; they didn't choose to be in this situation. So so uh, while it was an arduous uh, touch and go situation, of course, it's nothing into compare comparison to what all these hundreds of thousands, millions of Ukrainians that are coming in and out of the country and trying to, I realize that probably doesn't need saying, but I still feel like, you know, comparatively, it it was, it's nothing. Right, right. Yeah. Yes. Well, why don't we take a look at what you saw and experienced? hour overnight train ride from the sleepy border town of Helm, Poland to Kyiv is one of only a handful of ways you can get to one of Europe's great capital cities during the war. Hour upon hour through villages, farms, factory towns, wide open fields and forests. It's also on these trains that hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians fled the country at the outset of Russia's invasion on February 24th. 
Some on this very train, in this exact cabin, their lives upended. Kiev itself is a classically beautiful European capital city of almost three million people. Stunning old buildings, modern new ones, restaurants, clubs, museums, people out going about their day. And as a visitor to the city on a beautiful September day, you get a sense of normalcy at first. But that sense of normalcy starts to disappear a bit as your traveler's eye takes in the details of the city in its current state. The number of people in fatigues, the sandbagged and concrete enclosed statues, concrete blocks and welded together steel I-beams used to obstruct and derail tanks are scattered around the city ready to be pushed into the streets. And below the independence column in Maidan Square in the center of the city is a little grassy knoll filled with Ukrainian flags with the names of the dead from the war written on them. In a war whose intent seems in part to erase Ukrainian culture, it's that culture itself that has risen up to help unify the country. All of the artists, musicians, curators, satirists, all using their talents to contribute in any way they can to help galvanize Ukrainians in the fight for the survival of their country, both its proud heritage and its potential future. And it's because of that cultural front that we're here in Ukraine. Ian, I was just curious because that term cultural front, I, I love it. Um, I think it exemplifies the importance of culture. Did you know that culture in Ukraine was going to be as monumentally important as it turned out to be? No, no, I, I did not. And, uh, you know, honestly, I did not know a lot about Ukraine uh, uh, until until I started researching it, but I, I didn't, I didn't fully understand or appreciate, maybe that's the right word, the width and breadth of, of Ukrainian culture, quite, quite honestly, I, uh, you know, I, I knew a lot of modern arts, uh, modern musicians and, and in, in that realm, but, uh, boy, we jumped so deep into, Ukrainian, you know, old school, so to speak, Ukrainian culture. And it was just incredible to me. Honestly, there were there were so many times that that I was just uh, gobsmacked about about how how impressive this this place is. And and it a lot of it started from showing up in Kiev early on a early, early in what was it, mid-September. It was a beautiful fall day beautiful, beautiful capital city of, of 3 million people. It's just stunning old buildings, like I just said there, I guess, in the voiceover. But really, it was it was just an amazing place in our, we were staying right in the middle of the city, right next to the opera house in this cool boutique hotel, overlooking, seeing all these, uh, you know, onion domes and neoclassical buildings and parks and stuff. It, it just, it, it really blew me away. I, I can't... Uh, say it enough yeah and we you mentioned here ian uh that there was some sense of normalcy in kiev even though the war had been going on for about seven months how do you think residents reconciled their desire to live a normal life with the terrible reality that, that was going on and is going on yeah i i i think it's one of these things that that you can only <laughs> It's, I wouldn't even say better for us. It's definitely for worse. Uh, you can only experience by by going through it like all Ukrainians are, are going through. I mean, key, when we were there, when we were there, it was relatively quiet. Uh, the, the missiles and, and drones and all that, all that stuff started about three weeks after we left. But up until that point, I think they they had be almost I, I'll say that almost become accustomed to it. There are air raid warnings uh, all you know three or four times a day, and nobody would do a thing. Uh, they just keep going about about their about their business. I remember very crystal clearly because it was that first day, and we had just you know 
I'd been traveling for 34 hours and got to the hotel and I was up on the eighth floor. Again, sunny, beautiful day, looking out these big windows and the air raid warnings go off. And I had talked to people and and uh, in pre-filming uh, uh, interviews and, and kind of knew the vibe of what was going on, but it's still, still an air raid warning. And I've never been to a war zone. I'm not, I'm not a war correspondent. Uh, and And I remember standing there looking out and the streets are filled with people. Area warnings go off. They're going off in the hotel as well through through the whole uh, uh, emergency system there. Nobody in the street changed the way they were walking, did anything different. I remember very crystal clearly this, this mother with a little baby in a, in a stroller just continued walking on, on down the road. And, and, and honestly, it was seeing that mom and, and kid that made me think, oh, okay, that's that's what's going on here. But then fast forward three weeks, when, when missiles started falling, I thought very clearly about that same woman because it was just two blocks away from that hotel that two of the missiles landed. Uh, and I'm not at all saying this in regard to me, that would have been ridiculously random. Uh, but I was thinking of someone like that that you know, you whether you have a dog or a pet or or a child, you have these routines, right? Or or just you yourself going to the coffee shop every day. And I was thinking of that mom uh, making her normal walk with the stroller, heading in that same direction, and that really was like, oh my god, you know, it it just it all suddenly came back. And it was those three weeks later that I know, in talking to my friends there, uh, the air raid sirens, air raid warnings, really took hold again. Uh, and, and they started to take them very seriously again. So thank you for painting this, this picture for us, Ian. Um, we'll learn a bit more about the history of Ukrainian culture next. Our first stop is at Mostetsky Arsenal, one of the most prominent museums in the country, to meet with its director. Mostetsky Arsenal is the largest cultural museum in Ukraine housed in a massively impressive building that used to be an actual arsenal and fortification well into the 20th century. And this is the museum's director, Alessia Ostrovska Liuta. She holds and has held several board and committee positions over the years and has a master's in cultural studies. Because cultural centers have been targets during the war, the museum removed and hid all of its artworks. But in normal times, it's an incredibly vibrant place. Arsenal discusses what's valuable in society, often focusing on social debates, digging into those issues through the lens of contemporary art. And we also try to uncover what is unknown in culture to our audiences, and uh, paradoxically, that's often the Ukrainian culture. Because through the 20th century, Ukrainian culture was really hidden until uh, 1991, uh, when Ukraine gained its independence, you couldn't speak about many issues, wow. both political and cultural. And that uh, led to a situation where you had you have quite little knowledge about many phenomena. The Ukrainian language was banned from public usage in the 19th century. You couldn't teach it in school, you couldn't publish books in Ukrainian, you couldn't pu publish In the notes. 19th century? Yes, in, okay. by, by Tsarist Russia. Lenin thought it was impossible to keep Ukraine within the Russian uh, body without giving Ukraine some autonomy. Therefore, they started this uh, Ukrainization policy, which meant keeping bureaucracy in Ukrainian language, introducing Ukrainian language to school. You had Ukrainian theaters, Ukrainian writers, yeah. Ukrainian publishing houses. Why there was a lot going on in the 20s. Exactly. There was a very fruitful period, which ended with a huge massacre. In, in the, the 30s, 30s with the yeah. Stalin's uh, yeah. purges. Exactly. He executed Holodomor, which is political famine in Ukraine, which took up four million deaths, to curtail this um, Ukrainization policy, to make Ukraine more hom homogeneous with Russia. When Stalin introduced a social realist doctrine, authors that were not social realists were physically executed. And those were hundreds of uh, Ukrainian cultural fi uh, figures, hundreds. Cultural leaders of all types, from writers, educators, musicians, artists, were all at risk of imprisonment or execution, and their works destroyed. 
like the artist Mikhail Obojchik. Obojchikism was a modernist phenomenon of the 20th century. After the movement was banned, its leader, Mikhail Obojchik, was physically executed. The uh, murals were destroyed. Only a limited number of uh, artifacts remained uh, because uh, some other cultural figures, artists, uh, preserved them by hiding them in their apartments. For Ukrainian culture, uh, it was absolutely devastating. Yeah, you just wiped out an entire generation of, yeah. of knowledge and creation. I think it's a common knowledge on uh, Ukrainian cultural scene now that uh, 2020s were the next fruitful period. That's why for the cultural scene, this invasion falls into the pattern of destruction and it brings all the uh, you know expectations and emotions but also a lot of fear and resistance Ukrainian rail has in many ways been the lifeblood of the country during the war railway employees risking their lives to evacuate hundreds of thousands of people out of occupied areas with estimates of at least 300 rail employees losing their lives in the effort hauling invaluable supplies in from the West for distribution to the hardest hit parts of the country. Trains being seen as a sign of hope and a route to safety by Ukrainians. And it's those same trains that are now being used in a project to inspire and to serve as a very real connection between Ukrainians in the newly unoccupied areas of the East all the way to the West of the country. The project, called Train to Victory, was the brainchild of a Ukrainian PR firm called Grey's Todorchuk in collaboration with Ukrainian Rail itself, and they hired the person I'm with, Katya Taylor, to curate the project, working with a group of muralists to paint a train that would be seen by people all across the country. Katya herself wears a number of hats as a freelance curator, project designer, and author with multiple degrees ranging from economics, finance, and art history, with multiple projects running right now, all directed towards the role of art during the war. And we were lucky enough to spend a fair amount of time with her on this trip. That's pretty cool. There are seven painted rail cars and each one represents one of the occupied regions and the subject matter in each mural revolves around a hero from that region. It's like each different story is um, created or interpreted by different artists. Yeah. We have some abstract artists in yeah. there, some artists who work more in the realistic manners and so on. So we wanted to tell those stories in a different manner because, you know, each of us has also our own like visual language. Each rail car has a QR code that you can pull up extra information on the hero from that region. Yeah, look at that. So that there is all about Yeah, you can that have it in wagon. English. Let's have it oh, in yeah, English. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, so, so you see that. the, first you see the region which is... Oh, well, which that's from. Yeah, Zaporizhia. So this is the story of Zaporizhia. We can see that. It's listed, uh, listed here. This is uh, the name of the artist. And then we have the story a little bit of the uh, heroes of the region. That's such a great use of technology. Yeah, so easy. This is the Crimea. This is just a general image for you. It probably doesn't mean much, but um, uh, but to a, why to it is a Ukrainian, here? would they, would they kind of understand? Now, yes, because there is a story behind. The story is about a young street artist named Bogdan Ziza who protested Russia's occupation of Crimea by throwing paint in the colors of the Ukrainian flag on a Russian government building. He, like, threw the paint the yellow and um, yes, blue right. paint in them. Yeah. And the paint like started to, you know, leak. So that's, so that's why it's leaking paint. That art is in jail, pro probably for the next 15 years yeah. or something. Another impactful mural revolves around Ukraine's wheat fields. Uh, it is uh, about wheat. Ukrainian agricultural people, they keep working while the Russian war, because they were bombing the fields, and the fields started to burn. So there are like huge fires. All the fields were in the fire. Yeah. And uh, the guys who were working on the fields, they continued actually to, you know, to... Um, to harvest? Yeah, yeah, yeah they continued yeah. until the end. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is the last one we've that got here. It. That's perfect timing because I think the train's about to leave yeah, again. Yeah, they're saying goodbye to us. Ian, you mentioned that you took the train from Poland to Kiev. 
Uh, what did you experience on that train and how did that long journey impact your understanding of the country? Yeah, that's a that's a great question because it was like uh, tell me one way, and I don't know if it's if it's a workable analogy, but uh, um, it was almost like going through the wardrobe, you know, this this completely innocuous way to enter again a major European country, what the the you know a huge country, right, uh, of tens of millions of people through this tiny little border town through all these fields and, and forests and, and stuff like that. And it, 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 was, it was just a, an unusual way to start out this trip to, to see such a familiar uh, geography and geology, topography, you know. Uh, I mean, it's really familiar to me. It, it looks exactly like Minnesota uh, and, and going, going in that way and not really, not really knowing what we're going to see at the other end of the other end of the rail uh, was playing in the back of my head. The other interesting part was at that particular stage, people were actually starting to come back to Ukraine. A lot of the people that had left, and that that ended up being actually a, in in a great way, and ended up being a real challenge for us getting the rail tickets because a lot of people were saying, "Hey, look, we're going back." Uh, we're we're not staying out of our home, uh, so so that that part was also playing in my head that wow this is really cool that 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 they're deciding no we're we're coming back to where we belong. Uh, I I mean everyone makes their own choices and there's you know but but I love that that attitude. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, yeah, but it does. I mean, you were experiencing the reality at the time. Ukrainians, some of them, returning home, and um, I think yeah. that that's that that's important and very revealing about the circumstances of uh, things well, on the ground at the time. And that's really what I, I love about public transport as yes, well, is that totally. ability to, to see what's going on. And I mean, it, it's obvious here that Ukrainians really celebrate their rail system. Well, the rail system, uh, they often call it, I mean, it, it really was in many ways the lifeblood of that country. And I realized I had just said it in the voiceover, but it can't be overstated how important it was. Even on this train, a lot of the people on that train that, that we were filming uh, were coming out of occupied areas uh, and either uh, getting off in Kiev or going further uh, further west. And, and that in itself, seeing people on the train and, and knowing, imagining what they were leaving, I mean, their homes and, and just completely uprooted. Yet in the same breath, they, the people on the train, I mean, I'm waving to someone who's waving at us with a big smile, you know, and, and it's, you know, uh, it's, it was, it was really impactful to me, I, I, I gotta admit. Yeah, uh, yeah. I can to, only, only begin to imagine. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, well, next, we are going to turn to street art and murals, which I think um, is, is a beautiful part of Kiev as well. So let's take a look. That's, that's, that's great. That is, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Oh. Nice to meet you live and in person. Yeah, it's great. All right, till tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. See thanks. You. Murals have been showing up across the country and around the world. The walls they're painted on speaking out in constant protest of the war and in support of Ukrainians to the passers-by in the streets around them. Muralists like Sasha Korbin, who painted a Ukrainian flag getting stitched together on a wall in Kyiv, or this giant 10-story mural of a traditional Ukrainian woman in Tbilisi, Georgia, painted on a wall not coincidentally directly across the street from the offices of Russian diplomats. Nikita Kravtsov's adaptation of Liberty waving the Ukrainian flag on a wall in the center of Paris, or his collaboration on this mural with Vincent Paranov in Vienna, coincidentally part of a Europe-wide mural project organized by our friend Katya Taylor. Maria Vashashenko lost everything in Kharkiv and is now a refugee in the eastern Ukrainian city of Uzhgorod, where she and her fellow muralists painted two stunning walls bathed in the colors and culture of Ukraine. Which brings us back to Kyiv and the twin sisters Nicole and Michelle Feldman, known as Sestry Feldman. 
Before the war, they were well known in art circles all around Kyiv as street artists, doing everything from tagging walls all the way up to mural work, cartoons, illustrations. The messages in their work, traditional ones in the street art world, calling out power structures, societal issues. But since the war, that's all changed to one clear focus, supporting Ukraine. Now they're creating everything from small paintings around town with traditional Ukrainian motifs, cartoons with Putin and his one friend, a bomb, a deck of tarot cards with cultural images and figures from the war, and large-scale murals. We started out just walking around the sort of artist neighborhood of Kyiv, talking about the war, about street art, murals, tagging, architecture, talking about where they've been in life and where they see themselves going. Honestly, it was simply a really nice time just hanging out with the two of them. And then we walked by one of their murals and things jumped right into the meat of the interview. Cossacks is like old uh, soldiers of Ukraine. They still have this culture. The Ukrainian Cossacks date back centuries and to this day are revered fighters, including during this war. They are also a cultural icon that Ukrainians are proud to hold up as a reflection of their resilience as a country, as a symbol of their unshakable nature. It's about uh, now uh, the spirit. Cossack uh, is still in the people who stay here. Yeah. And uh, the technology changes. They can um, yeah. make attack from uh, uh, drones or information drones. war. I love that. I love that idea, though, because what, what we do in this show and, and why in large part I wanted to come here is because of the idea of Russians trying to erase Ukrainian culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. and I love that you're using this cultural figure as a form of resistance in a modern world. They wanted to ask to all work that uh, you can have no uh, History. cultural language and else, uh, but because of war, now everyone knows that you can have uh, culture. Do you find that since the war started, there's this element yeah. of yeah. Ukrainians like, yeah. suddenly like, oh my More God, realized. we have a really cool culture, <laughs> yeah. right? Yes. Is that true or is that... Yeah, it's true, like uh, people feel more patriotic yeah. and uh, more interesting in them all rules, stories and yeah. Yeah. history. Yeah, it's like you understand where you're from. I think like first time when it's happening, yeah. like war started, you can't understand how can it happen in real. I wanted to understand uh, um, mind, uh, psychology of tyrants. Yeah, yeah. Say that again. Psychology, uh, psychology. of tyrants. Psychology of Tyrants, okay, yeah. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Well, look, your, your English is actually great and my Ukrainian doesn't exist, so I, I don't, so, yeah, so in my mind, you're doing a lot better than I am. Do you think that feeling of uh, pride in culture and, and uh, knowledge of culture maybe will continue? Uh, you know, maybe yeah. not at the same level, but will continue? Maybe even a more level, like, I like because it. it started. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah, and uh, I think uh, we don't want to stop, like, everybody yeah. here. Want to more, know more about themselves, about history. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and all, are all your kind of friends? Yeah, in, everybody in starts to be interesting and make something for yeah. our country. I'm curious, Ian, as you describe here and as we see that motifs and themes of the art uh, that um, the Sestri Feldman create uh, has changed with the war. What is demand like for this kind of art uh, during the war? Do you know, is it, is it still something people want to see? Are they still getting work essentially? Yeah, yeah, they all are. And I, I actually, you know, I communicate with, with uh, the, these two uh, Sestri Feldman sisters and as well as some other muralists on, you know, through our Instagram pages and stuff, they're all over the place. They're all over, well, uh, unoccupied Ukraine, but also all over Europe. Uh, I mean, uh, some of them were even in, uh, where were they in Kenya, I think, uh, uh, doing a mural through uh, Katya Taylor, actually, if you remember um, uh, her. Uh, so they're they're definitely doing a lot of work. Uh, Sasha Corbin, all of the muralists are <laughs> they're so so busy. I mean, there was another section, of course, 
for time, we weren't able to put it in uh, for our purposes now, but there are these two guys that are uh, doing unbelievably beautiful murals and they're swamped as well. So there's there's definitely a big, big call for it. And I, I, I love, in general, I love murals. I mean, we did a whole episode on murals in Puerto Rico in the first season, but it, it's it's such a moment for art for the people. I mean, anyone gets to look at it and, and anyone can walk by it and and take their own interpretations from it. And I, I think I think it can get a message out again so quickly uh, to such a large, large group of people. I, I love what what the role it's playing in this in this war. So yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Thanks, Ian. Mm. And next we will turn to music, also very important. Yeah. And then there's music. And Kazka created a heartbreaking video early on in the war and since then has been doing charity concerts and other work all over the world. No, I'm not. Okian Elzi and its frontman Slava Vakarchuk, a band used to playing packed stadiums around Europe, now plays for the front lines and does countless interviews and charity concerts. The indie folk band Daka Braka has a worldwide fundraising tour that barely leaves time for travel in between gigs. And there are countless others in all genres of music doing whatever they can to make a difference. Which led us to the wildly popular group Onuka and their lead singer Nata Shijanko. <laughs> Nuka is known as a cutting-edge folk electronica band. Their music goes much deeper than that label. Please don't try to explain, as you don't not Nata's own family is steeped in Ukrainian culture, and that culture is infused throughout their music. Some of Anuka's greatest live performances are playing alongside the National Academic Orchestra of Folk Instruments. Nata and her husband Eugene Filatov, who is Nata's other creative half and co-founder of Anuka, and their young son Sasha live in Kyiv, but their home in Chernigiv has been in the family for five generations. Nata, only two days back from a charity concert in Lisbon, Spain, was kind enough to invite us up to their home there to spend the day with her, and her brother Sasha gave us a ride. You know, Ian, since I viewed your program here for the first time i've started listening to onuka on spotify and it yeah. really reminded me that music is such a wonderful travel souvenir and it's something you can get from a program like this without even traveling so for all of our fellow travelers tonight who enjoyed some of the music we've heard here you can find a lot of it maybe not all of it but a lot of it wherever you listen to your music yeah absolutely yeah and it's well worth digging into totally we're not finished with Nata yet. We'll go to her home city next. Chernigiv is around 150 kilometers north of Kyiv, along one of the two main highways the Russians used to try and take Kyiv in February and March. It's also along this highway that the world saw some of the first signs of Ukrainians fighting back and winning. All along the way, there are little villages destroyed, military roadblocks every 10 or 20 kilometers, tank tracks embedded in the highway's asphalt. 
And you never escape the air raid sirens here. The siege of Chernigov started on the second day of the invasion, February 25th, cutting off Chernigov from Kyiv and the rest of the country with regular and seemingly indiscriminate shelling of the city, killing hundreds over the next several weeks. But it all ended around March 31st, when the Ukrainians were able to retake the highway we just came up on, reconnecting Kyiv with Chernigov, pushing out the Russian troops, and ending the siege of the city. This is a place with hard stories to tell, and what happened here is still happening in cities across the front lines of Ukraine. But it's also a place where Ukrainian fighters held the line, resisted the Russian invasion, and won freeing their own city and playing a key role in helping to stop the Russians from taking Kyiv itself. Chernigov is one of the most ancient cities in Ukraine, dating back to the 700s with deep cultural roots. And you would be hard pressed to find a stronger advocate for that culture than Nata. What's, what's going on in here is tradition and uh, culture and just an interest in your past, yet your music is super modern. I wanted to play electronica by Ukrainian instruments. wanted to show how bandura can sound, how cymbalum, how sopilkas and all these our instruments can sound weird, modern, unique. <laughs> to show Ukrainian young people how our instruments can look like, can sound like. And to be proud of Ukrainian culture. Today is, uh, what is it, September, uh, I guess we I We are waiting watch. for it. So September over. 18th, mm -hmm. watching the news, mm -hmm. there, there, there seems like there's great progress going on, mm -hmm. or, or progress going on on the east. Yeah. But all, all these areas uh, are, are starting to be taken unoccupied. back. Unoccupied. Unoccupied. Yeah. yeah. There's also uh, hard stories coming out yeah. of that. Do you allow yourself room for hope? You know, uh, yeah, space for hope. Space for hope in this. There is nothing uh, except hope. I have never felt so happy to live here, to belong here, to know what my purpose is. My purpose is to make Ukraine blossom. I uh, understand it uh, like a cultural front, the front line of culture. Oh, yeah. yeah. What our artists and colleagues do with this uh, donating and charity concerts. I think that this the front line of culture is also very important and uh, it's not in comparison with the real uh, front line yeah. but uh, it's supporting our rear guard of it we're here because of exactly what you're talking about about this this second front of of culture i mean we're not we're not war correspondents you know this is a television series about art around culture around the world mm -hmm. and it, it was seeing Slava uh, Vakarchuk yeah I, I saw him playing the piano singing this like raspy voice beautiful heart-wrenching song <laughs> Ian Vakarchuk performs with such passion. Isn't it just incredible? It's amazing to me. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, get choked up every time I see that one. Yeah, it's amazing.
Listening to you and not to hear, there are a couple questions which come to my mind. The first one you sort of alluded to earlier, this uh, overarching theme of taking historic traditions and making it more modern. Uh, the use of the Cossack for Sestri Feldman, for example. Do you feel that Ukrainians have a strong connection to their past and a will to preserve it? Is that something you found? Yeah, absolutely. And and I uh it's certainly exemplified in, in Sestri Feldman as a I think it's fair to say as a new thing to them. I mean, they were, and we talked about it. Uh it didn't make it into the I can't remember if we made it in the in the full episode, but we talked about, you know, them being in their early 20s and and traditional counterculture, you know screw the man, uh, that that sort of mentality, that that all the stereotypes you could think of of, of graffiti artists, that's Sestri Feldman. And they're the ones that told me that. They said, yeah, that was definitely us. But but since the invasion started, it it completely turned them around. And now they're they're creating all these things to raise money for the military, to raise money for your know, you know uh, medical supplies, and and using it through this motif of traditional culture, something that was never a part of their, at least in my mind, I don't think it was a part of their work, uh, to at least to the extent that it is now. Um, of course, not a has always been about Ukrainian culture. I mean, her her grandfather, uh, actually, interestingly enough, Onuka translated means granddaughter. So her grandfather was this major, major figure in her life. And actually, the interview that we, we did was in his workshop. He was this super famous uh, musical instrument builder. He, he worked in this giant piano factory and invented all these instruments. and completely inspired Nata from a tiny age. There are portions that of course didn't fit into the into what we're doing here tonight, where, you know, she's a tiny, she's a three-year-old already starting to play the sepilka, the the flute. So for Nata, it's it was baked into her DNA at a really early age. But I I I truly love this irony. And I don't maybe it's maybe it's not ironic, but that the idea of this war wanting that Russians part of it was wanting to erase Ukrainian culture and absorb them back into uh, the old Soviet Union days. Uh, and it, it's, again, I think I've already said it in the clips you picked out, it's done completely the exact opposite, inspired Ukrainians to dig into their past and, and be proud of their past and, uh, and move it into the future. And I, I absolutely love that. Right, right, exactly. And I'm curious, you mentioned that you stayed in or staying in touch with uh, at least a few of the people that you met on this in this project. Uh, and Nata here displays hope and optimism. And I'm curious if you know if Nata, if some of the other amazing people you, you met when you went to Ukraine, if they still have a sense of, of hope and optimism, uh, what is a, a year and a few months later? Yeah, I so and I do keep in uh, you know relative touch with with all of them through uh, Telegram. The their ver well, you I'm sure you you Ben you know what Telegram is, but it's basically uh, WhatsApp except it's Telegram. Anyhow, um, so we communicate now and then. Uh, you know, not to uh, they they had a, a second child actually. Uh, uh, they had a baby maybe four months ago or something like that. So if there's uh, if you're going to find hope anywhere, that that's certainly uh, a great way to to have hope, right? Uh, another another generation uh, talking to. Well, I'm I'm about to refer to people in, in that you're going to see in the future, so I won't. But I I absolutely see them having hope and being inspired to keep pushing forward, even though this is. I mean, it is dragging on and the, the the front lines is in, there's no question, it's in a hard stalemate, but they are still pushing and pushing hard to do whatever they can. Uh, so yeah, I, I see them as still being hopeful. I see, I see them as, I mean, they're not in denial. They're, they're also, this sucks. This is hard. This is, people are dying. It's, but, but there's still hope. 
Uh, and I would imagine you need to have that. So, yes, absolutely. I'm so glad to hear from you that that hope is still alive. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Ian. Nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's been telling me all about you. So, are you cool with coming around with us? Absolutely. I'd love to. Stas' day job is as a website designer, but he's also started a nonprofit called Chernigov Wooden Lace, restoring traditional houses. In normal times, this work helps preserve the history of the region, but in wartime, preserving traditional homes like these takes on all sorts of additional meaning. And Stas' restoration projects have no shortage of people wanting to jump in and be a part of preserving culture here. Stas even gives tours through the city of the houses they've worked on, as well as some that they haven't. I, I started working on this house last fall, yeah. and I wanted to finish it this year, yeah. regardless of the war. So he used his days off from the military to finish the project. People who um, walk by this house on a daily basis look at this and, and see that uh, there's still, you know, a, a beam of light and hope and some move forward. This is something that uh, makes people smile. And uh, since uh, we're able to do this, then why not? Keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is Ukraine. This is. This is Ukraine. This is northern Ukraine. Yeah. This is uh, uh, this is typical for the north of uh, Chernihivska Oblast and the north of Sumska Oblast. Yeah. And and the people who created, who, who built this, these houses, they they had style. They had a yeah, sense style. sense of yes, aesthetics. Yes, I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and you know, yeah. every every house owner wanted to be unique. He or she wanted to be different from his or her neighbors. Yeah. Basically, people were. Uh, show-offs in a good way. Most of these houses belong uh, to several owners. And this dates back uh, to when uh, the Soviets uh, conquered uh, these areas. So people who used to own this house were kicked out. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this house was divided between several other people who didn't have any connection no. to, yeah. this, to this property. As a result, so many of these great old places fell into disrepair over the coming decades. Stas's restoration philosophy revolves around the idea that these homes are ever-evolving things. Yeah, look at these colors. They are modern. They're contemporary. They are. It's an interesting observation of, of how people react uh, to these kind of decisions, because obviously these colors are not typical. No. They are not historical. Honestly, I don't, I, I, I'm not a supporter of sort of, you know, fighting for some historical appearance of whatever, because this color is something that helps you embed this uh, piece of, of history into today's reality. I love this idea of respecting culture and tradition, but part of that respect, in my mind, is letting it evolve and move into the future. Yep. So uh, instead of making it a stagnant thing, mm -hmm. and and to me that that to me that respects it, you know, and, and it keeps it progressing. It, it so. mattered. Dobre day. So it mattered for me to put my hand on this house and, and bring it yeah. back to life. Plus, because it belongs to several owners as well, uh, it used to be <clears throat> painted uh, in you know all kinds of colors, and you could clearly see that. It belongs to different people, to different people who yeah. don't talk to one another when they, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, when they decide right. to paint their... I've seen houses like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the important conditions of restoring this house when we, when we talked to the owners was that we will collectively choose a color scheme which would work for everybody mm -hmm. and at the same time would paint the house as if it belongs to a single family. Yeah. So it looks uniform. These structures are so stunning, Ian, and I think it's exceptionally uh, meaningful that during a time when so many structures, buildings in Ukraine are being damaged and destroyed, here you have people uh, refurbishing, revitalizing these historic historic buildings. I think it's it's just amazing. Yeah, and and Stas was incredible, and I, I get that thing. You know, we got to cut things for time, but but what uh, wasn't there? There's a part right at the beginning of the interview where we're talking about Stas was conscripted to into the military at the beginning of the war when uh, Russia surrounded Chernigov. And, you know, he's a website designer. He has absolutely no military background. The people that were conscripted with him had no military background. And in his group of, I think, 12 people, 
he had four friends in his in his group uh, that were killed and uh i think four others were injured and he got out uh without a scratch and it just it's random this uh, this is a, a kid i mean he's a kid he's but uh, who you know like everyone else there was just suddenly thrown into this and had, had seen the worst possible things and in that same breath instead of you know going down a dark hole he he and so many other ukrainians decide to decide to stand up and and make a difference so when he 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 gets this got this look in his face and and it'll make sense when he says in spite of the war you can see how pissed off he is and so determined to continue restoring houses and continue to rebuild and preserve culture in his hometown that he's lost so many friends uh defending this place and to me that that is inspiring on 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 so many different levels i was so i mean i was impressed with everyone I, and i'm not kidding with every single person we met i was so thoroughly impressed with stas was very much at the top of that list yeah, yeah that determination and passion he has is 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 something else yeah as our time up here in Chernigov was coming to an end, we made our way back to Nata's house. See, I've said it over and over again on, on, this, on this trip, but it's so incredible to see everybody, at least that we've run into at every level, uh, just doing whatever they can do to, to pitch in and, and, and make a difference. But, we uh, have a very rough way yeah. to our freedom, but it would be very deeply cherished we talked about hope earlier and 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 the need for hope and the existence of hope yeah. in ukrainians and uh, uh, the hope is so big that it can't content in me uh, i can't i can't contain contain it, it yeah. yeah it's bigger than my mind yeah but with the 11 p.m curfew fast approaching it's yeah. time to stop time to go uh, i think, I think we should go okay we got a curfew to beat not to be stuck here yeah all right we spent the last few hours of our stay here filming around town before our train ride back to Poland. While filming right under the Independence Column in Maidan Square, I happened to see some beautifully painted I-beam battlements that are actually called hedgehogs across the street. I had read about these before our trip, that a woman was painting hedgehogs around town with traditional Ukrainian motifs. So we headed over to have a look. While we were filming, a woman came up and set down some boxes next to the hedgehogs and started to unpack her gear. That woman was the person who was painting the hedgehogs, Varvara Lohovin, just happening to come down to the square on a Sunday afternoon to paint some more. I introduced myself and we had a quick chat before heading off to catch our train. But it was this moment of happenstance that, for me, became the perfect anecdote for what's happening here. While Varvara has a very successful business in her normal life, she also has a university degree in art and wanted to use that talent not only as an outlet of her own expression during the war, her own form of resistance, but also to add something to the people's lives around her, to give them something to smile about, to be inspired by, by coming down to the center of Kyiv on her free time to paint, imbuing an object of war with the cultural motifs of the people it's there to defend. That attitude is my lasting impression of Ukrainians. In a war whose intent is to erase, to cow a population into submission, it's done the exact opposite, uniting a country in a singular fight for their freedom. The people we met with here are representatives of the millions more Ukrainians in all corners of society doing the same thing, contributing in any way they can. Ukrainians were unwillingly dropped into this crucible of war, but as hard and as brutal as it has been, and surely still will be, there seems no doubt in the people's minds we met here that what will emerge from that crucible will be a stronger country filled with people who have a renewed sense of pride in their history and who will carry their proud culture and country into the future.
Ian, you did a masterful job with this program. <laughs> we only saw about half of it. So um, whoever wants to see more, we have a link to your YouTube page where you can watch the program in full. But I just think it's it's so valuable what you've been able to put together here in sharing these individual lives and um, the reality of, of what's going on right now. So thank you so much. No, I appreciate it. Thanks for uh, uh, getting it out there. It really means a lot. It genuinely does, yeah. And Julianne has been sending me many questions. We have quite a few. I'm going to give just a brief word from our sponsor for the evening, and it's gonna be short and it's it's really quite relevant. You know, right now um, we can't really travel to Ukraine, at least for the most part, but you can learn about Ukrainian culture when you travel. We have a 10 day Best of Poland tour and we have a 15 day Central Europe tour. And there are millions of Ukrainians who have moved to this part of Europe since the war started. They've begun businesses, um, they have charity concerts and performances. When you travel in Central Europe, you can learn about Ukrainian culture. And in fact, uh, our co-author Cameron Hewitt he recently told me that one of his favorite restaurants this year was a Ukrainian restaurant in Warsaw, Poland. So there are certainly opportunities um, to experience Ukraine in Europe until we can travel to Ukraine again. All right, Ian, you ready for some questions? Yeah, let's do it. Absolutely. Um, we touched on many cultural topics, so I think a few folks wanted me to ask something about food. Um, Obviously, Ukraine has uh, an excellent uh, cuisine, uh, and I think they're working to distinguish their cuisine with Russia a little bit as well. What kind of food did you experience on this trip? And um, did you feel it was another proud aspect of Ukrainian culture? All right, I'm gonna disappoint you with the answer to this question. Uh, uh, although, with well, well, only because I don't remember the names of, of the things that we had, but the the I, we had one, super standout experience. And that was with Nata up at her home in Chernigiv, uh, where we took a break from uh, uh, the interview. And again, keep in mind, there's just two of us. There's there's the two Ians. Uh, and then there's Nata, and at the time, her three-year-old son, and her uh, nanny, and her brother, her brother who drove us up there and, and back. And they had laid out this wonderfully traditional Ukrainian lunch uh, for us. And I, I'm killing myself because I do not remember any of the names. I'm a terrible note taker when I'm traveling. Uh, but all I can tell you, it, it, it was it was so, so great. I mean, it's, yeah, I'm not even going to try. Uh, I, I think there were yeah, I'm not going to try. It, it was just, I mean, if nothing else, the food was great. And it was this, just this wonderful communal. I mean, I, I don't need to tell you, sharing food with someone uh, it, it brings you to a, a, another another level, especially when you're in that person's home and they prepared it for you. Uh, just the fact that they prepared a meal for us uh, really meant a lot because because they have other things going on in their lives. No, I, I, that that really was uh, a meaningful travel moment for me. Yeah, I can certainly understand why. You know, I had Ukrainian for lunch in honor of today's episode, and I had nice. olipsi. Olipsi is like uh, meat filled. I don't think it has to be meat, but it's rice and meat often uh, filled cabbage roll. And then I had I borscht. Think we had that. Yeah, halupsi, very popular. You know, as I told you, Ian, my grandparents were Ukrainian. So I. From the I West had... of Ukraine, right? Yeah. 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 And, and, I, so... and we did have, I'm glad you said borscht because we did have that. And I'm sure there's a debate as to whether that's, uh, well, I'm sure there's a Russian one and I'm sure there's a Ukrainian one. You know, it, it's. Uh... Well, funnily enough, you should mention that because when I was a student in Krakow, Poland, I took a class on the history of Polish cuisine and um, I gave a report on borscht. Uh, or in, in Polish, it's barsh. But anyway, um, I found that it's most likely to be Ukrainian. I think it deserves to be considered Ukrainian if we yeah. have to pick between Poland, Russia, Ukraine. It's been eaten there for many, many centuries, I think. Um, I'll, I'll absolutely accept that. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Also, on the topic of language, um, 
You asked the sisters Feldman about how the war has impacted how Ukrainians feel about their culture. What did you experience when you were there on the topic of language? Because many Ukrainians speak both Russian and Ukrainian. Has this changed with the war? Absolutely, big time, uh, in a big, big way. And, and we had a, an extended conversation with Nata, her brother, and, and a, a big segment that, that just didn't fit into what we were doing with this uh, uh, charity group up there that we hung out with, this unbelievable group called This Is My, My City. Anyhow, and we, we talked to them about uh, who speaks Ukrainian and, and who doesn't speak Ukrainian. And I, I remember specifically one of the guys that's the head of this, this charity, uh, said on his days off uh, from, he was also in the military, and on his days off, he was taking Ukrainian language lessons. Nata and her brother and her parents uh, set up their own telegram uh, uh, conversation that they said it has to be exclusively in Ukrainian. I mean, and it's understandable. Her her parents, I assume, came up in the era where you needed to speak Russian if you wanted to, you know, compete in business and try. You know, it just was a necessity. Um, so uh, that that was that was a big a big part of it. Uh, and Nata got a, a tattoo of a, a specifically Ukrainian uh, 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 letter from the alphabet called Yi. Uh, which has also become a, a partisan kind of spray painting thing that they'll put in, uh, people will spray paint in occupied areas on telephone poles and walls because it's apparent, well, you would probably know more uh, than I do about that letter, but it's meant to be this this sign of uh, solidarity that is so quintessentially Ukrainian that people, I actually met besides Nada, someone else that also had just gotten a e uh, tattoo while while we we're there as well. So uh, the Ukrainian language, uh, boy, is is I mean, how how do you get more culturally specific than language, right? Uh, and it's it's very much on the rise. So to on this topic, Ross asks, why are there two pronunciations of Kiev? And I think do you have a sense of that? Uh, yeah, and I don't think I I don't think I say it right. Uh, and I don't, I, I, it's, I don't think we, you and I both say it differently. You say Kiev, I say Kiev, and I think it's actually right in between those two. There's like a little uh, glottal stop kind of thing that, that I don't get. Uh, I don't exactly know how to put it in there. Um, do you, do you know? I mean, you're. I think your pronunciation is closer from Ukrainian, at least that's my guess. And part of it is because I, I studied in St. Petersburg. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so I I think Kiev is more like K-I-E-V, I think, which comes from Russian. And Kiev, or the way you say it, I think is from the Ukrainian or closer to that. It, it, yeah. is, it is closer. I, I was talking to a, a, actually a Ukrainian uh, person here in Minneapolis who pronounced it correctly to me, and I, I still, I still couldn't, couldn't quite finesse it, so... Well, I think that um, we should spell it K Y I V. I believe that's the spelling from Ukrainian, yeah. and and Kiev is is close to the right pronunciation. Yeah. yeah. All right. What else? You you mentioned a charity before. Now, obviously, Rick Steves Europe. You know, we don't have any specific recommendations are on our end. But Ian, do you have any recommendations of worthwhile charities or places to donate um, to oh, help? Oh yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, there there were. This was an amazing thing to me that Katya, uh, the the guys, the this is my city guys that weren't in this uh, episode, in in what what you were able to fit in time wise, but are, it's in my episode anyhow. And Stas, all of them have have created these. Uh, well, anyhow, have created these charities, and and just that idea that. You're in the middle of a war. You're worried about your own life. You're worried about your family's life, and instead of just sitting on that, you're deciding to create all these other things that are helping your fellow Ukrainians. And I, I could only hope that I would be, uh, I mean, God willing, I never experienced something like this, but that I would be that proactive and that, uh, you know, thoughtful about people around me instead of just focusing on my own stuff. So anyhow, Katya uh, has this, uh, and you'll see it if you watch the whole episode, 
uh, there's a huge section of Katya Tai. I mean, she's just this unbelievable person. Uh, but she has one thing called uh, Artists Support Ukraine that uh, raises funds for artists all around Ukraine. So she gives out little grants to um, various artists that write in saying, look, I'm, I'm in an occupied area. We don't have food. We don't, you know, it, it's, a, it's a really inspiring uh, uh, charity. So that's one. Uh, the, uh, the guys, uh, this is my city from Chernigov, who they uh, started it, uh, I think, right when Chernigov, right after Chernigov was liberated, once the Russians had to, had to leave, uh, were forced out uh, by people like Stas, uh, they started this foundation raising money for, for uh, medical supplies and raising money to send, like, honest to God, coats, jackets, uh, vehicles, things like that to, to their buddies that are on the front lines because they, they don't have uh, often coats, jackets, things like that. And especially when you're coming to what's uh, like last winter, this is going to be another brutal winter on the front lines, uh, uh, sitting in trenches. So the This Is My City uh, charity would be a great one. And then, of course, Stas and his group, oh, my God. I mean, they are single-handedly restoring houses around Chernigov, which is, you know, uh, helping, as as we saw in this piece, helping culture uh, survive and 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 move forward. So if if any of you, there are a lot of people watching. If any of you are able to give up, you know, ten bucks, twenty bucks, whatever, to to one of these groups, that would be awesome. And we did put them in the chat, and they will be a follow up email. As well. Oh, cool! Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and just full disclosure, uh, you know. The uh, is it Monobank? Monobank, mm. you'll see it if you go and look at the charity. Monobank is basically PayPal, so it, it's all written in Ukrainian, but it's you can pull it up online. It's a legit bank, and it's what all these charities are using. But I, I know there are a lot of places people can put their money, uh, but even ten bucks goes a long way to people that that are friends of mine, and I know where it's going. Anyhow. That, that's a big enough pitch, but man, they're they're great people and they're working hard and they could use the help. Yeah, thanks so much, Ian. Yeah. And this is a comment uh, from Rosemary. She says that you should submit this to ABC and CNN so as many people um, watch as possible. <laughs> I agree. I love it. Absolutely. I, I will. I'll see if I can figure out a way to do that. And Gary asks, in your opinion, is there such a thing as a safe visit as a tourist to Ukraine at the moment? Mm, I don't think so. I, I really don't. I mean, no, no, is the short answer. Because you you never know. Even, even Lviv, which is where we were going to go at first, which is only 20 miles over the border, uh, seemed super safe. But even Lviv is getting... Uh, these Shahid drones that that, that Russia is buying from anyhow is getting is getting bombed. So I don't think so. Uh, I get it. I, I get I get where you're going, but uh, probably not yet. I'm sorry yeah. to say. Yeah. Yeah, that's my impression as well. Yeah. Um, we have time for just one more question, and it's from Adrian. Adrian asks. What do you feel is the future of Ukraine regarding travel post-war? Do you believe there will be a wave of interest? Yeah, absolutely. No, no question about it. I mean, we even while we were there, uh, look, you already got me excited talking about that. I'm leaning forward and stuff. We while we were there, we were talking about we have to go back after after the war, the war to film an episode to to show the beauty of Ukraine. And and if you so there are so many absolutely horrible things that that are, are a result of this war. But I think one positive thing is what the rest of the world, including myself and probably including a lot of a lot of the people watching this, is learning so much about this incredible culture and this incredible country. Uh, and I, I think from what I only know a, a sliver of it, but there's so much to explore there as a tourist from mountains to seas to ancient uh, architecture to great food to modern culture i mean you have got it all in in that in that country i would go there 
any day of the week after this, you know, God willing, when the war is over, it'd be an incredible place to go with incredible people that are so, so welcoming. So, yeah, absolutely. And I am optimistic that uh, the day will come before too long. And I agree with you. I think I, I don't know if there's a people or a place that is more deserving of your tourist dollars. So when the time is right, I think there will be a big wave. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think so. Great question, and I, I, think, I think that's the case. Well, Ian, that's all we have time for this evening. I really enjoyed this. This was really something special, a, a different Monday night travel, I think, for us, but so, so valuable. So thank you again for taking your evening. And I'm glad you, you know, it's nice. You get to be comfy at home. It's like all of us. I know, this is great. Yeah, show. comfort of my own office. This is perfect. No, thank you and thank the whole Rick Steves crew uh, for being willing to uh, put put this on. I know it's a little outside of the your normal bailiwick but uh i i'm really glad and it's not surprising to me that that you guys would would find this uh uh worthwhile to do and of course it is yeah well if you ever find yourself in the seattle area you'll have to come up to see us all right i'm coming your way <laughs> yeah. thanks so much ian yeah thank you and um, everyone here with us tonight, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed our look at Ukrainian culture with Ian. And next week, we have a really fun show. Pat O'Connor, our guidebook co-author and tour guide, he's coming back for a look at his 15 top hikes across Europe. So I think that that'll be one to watch as well. That's next Monday. So we hope to see you then. Good night, Ian. Good night, Julianne. Good night, everyone.